Okay, so last week we had kind of a, a, a different week. We're in this new series called uh, You Asked For It. And um, uh, we've taken your questions and we're preaching sermons in response to your questions. And so last week we did this message and it was all about cheap grace. Do you guys remember cheap grace? So we talked about cheap grace, the fact that God forgives you all of your sins and he guarantees you heaven and a new life. That's what being born again is, radically saved. That's what it is. But it was not free or cheap to Jesus. We talked about the fact that it cost him everything. We talked about the fact that when he took on the cross, he took on your sins. Not just the sins of the world, he took on your sins. And when we think about every dark and selfish act that we've ever done, and we think about what should the emotional and the cosmic and the justice and and, and the spiritual consequences be for all of that, and you put it all in a pile, Jesus took all that stuff on for you. He paid it in full. He suffered through it. So that you wouldn't have to suffer through it. The amazing grace of God. Amen? Amen. So we talked about that last week and how amazing that is. And it cost him something. It wasn't cheap for him. And, and, and we have to come to him. We talked about this parable. If you remember, and there was a servant. And the servant owed the king a billion dollars. Do you remember a billion dollars? King, the, the servant owed the king a billion dollars. And... And Jesus told this parable about this dad and the servant comes to the king and you kind of expect um, Jesus to tell the story ultra simply and maybe the servant would just come and say, hey king, would you forgive me for my billion dollar debt? But that's not what he does. What the servant does, and it's very, very telling, is the servant goes to the king and he says, hey, would you give me a little bit more time so that I can pay you back? And that was big because Number one, he can't pay it back, right? Yes? He can't pay it back. A billion dollars? Um, but the second reason it's big is because I think there's a little bit of us in that servant where sometimes we go to God and we're like, hey, I'd like to pull myself up from my own bootstraps. And I'd like to pay you back. Everything in the past, I'd like to clean that up myself. Maybe I'd like a little God help, but at the end of the day, I want to fix me. And if you're going to come to God, all that self-reliance that you come with, that has to get surrendered. You have to give that up. And for us self-reliant folks, and I'm talking to every single soul in the room, that's a big sacrifice. So costly grace costs us too. It doesn't cost us trying to fix everything. It costs us giving up our self-reliance. So we talked about all that last week and super fun time and I got to the end of one of those services and a man came up to me after the service and I don't remember which one it was, but he was very moved by the service and he just, he confided in me. He said, you know what? He said, I'm struggling with my past and I'm struggling to forgive my past and tr- struggling to believe that I'm forgiven. Do we have that question up there on the, uh, I, I struggle, here, there it is. I struggle to believe I'm forgiven. How can I believe? That was just the conversation that we had. And while I'm having that conversation, I had one of those moments, maybe you've had a moment like this, where he's sitting there talking to me, but it's as if God is talking to me through him. And I just could tell the moment that I was in, and I'm like, no, this is the Lord. And, um, and the truth is, Pastor Ricky and I had a completely different message planned for today. It was a great message, by the way. <laughs> so good. A++. plus plus. Um, I was going to kill it but I'm not preaching that one. Um, We're going to preach this. Um, Because when the man said what he said, I'm like, this isn't just him. This is us. This is us. And, And then the thought happens of like, oh God, I feel like I've taught this before. And I get bored really easily. But God's like, no, we need it again. And we need it in a different way. So I'm just going to warn you, this is going to be a very different message. Um, we're not gonna, tr- we're, we're not gonna have as much Bible today, even though there's gonna be a lot of Bible. Um, this is gonna be a very personal conversation between me and you. Um, I'm just gonna try and go after that question. I'm gonna try and help you understand how God has dealt with this particular issue in my own life. And I'm just gonna give you my testimony of that and explain it as we go. But it's gonna feel a little bit different. Like the first half of the message is just um, kind of one story to help you understand. 
God wants you to stop with the idea of cleaning yourself up, and he wants you to stop with the idea of earning anything in your life. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Now, some of you, that's a lot of theology, and you weren't following it very much. The, the second part I really want you to know there is that when you get saved... Righteousness is given to you through faith. And that's Bible language for these are all the good works you should have done in your life before you die. If I was to look at you and assess your entire life and say God's expectation is that you would accomplish these things before you die. That is your righteousness. And the scripture comes along and says it's not about your righteousness anymore. It's not about you trying to achieve those things. It's about the righteousness of Jesus and his sinlessness got given to you. Theologians call this imparted righteousness. And that's why we can say all your sins from the past, the present, and the future, and I know that tweaks some of you, are 100% forgiven. And when you come to the judgment seat of Christ, which all of us will come to the judgment one day, it is an appointment we will all keep. Amen? Amen? We'll stand before God and he will not list off your sins to you if you are in Christ and you're born again. Instead, he will look at you and he will see only the righteous resume of Jesus Christ himself. Amen. And he'll be pleased with you. Amen. And he'll love you. And he'll welcome you to heaven because of what Jesus did, not because of any of the things that you ever did. Is your mind blown yet? Because it should be. It should be. And so today is going to be about the fact that not only were we saved by the righteous resume of Jesus given to us, imparted to us, but we live every day leaning on that same righteousness. Every single day of our life is going to be trying to believe that. Okay, so my story, um, I grew up as a church kid. And I only did religious things because I was told that be a good church kid. And none of it meant anything to me. And I didn't really care about Jesus, care about God. None of it had reached my heart. And many of you know what I'm talking about with all of that. And so I was just kind of going through the motions and doing the Christian thing. And then finally, God did get a hold of my heart. And when he got a hold of my heart and showed me what I had really done in my life and what I really deserved, I was crushed by it. And it wasn't just mental, it was every part of myself was absolutely shattered by the idea of what I had done. And then Jesus came and saved me, and I was radically saved. And nobody could stop me smiling, and nobody could stop me talking about Jesus. Have you ever seen an annoying new Christian who won't stop talking about Jesus? I was that person because I knew I deserved nothing in this life. People talk about their rights. I had no rights. They were all gone. I had given them up because I was guilty. And then Jesus saved me. And when you know that in your bones, it changes you. And your life changes. And I had that experience. It was real for me. And then I got discipled. And people, what this fancy Christian word just means, somebody taught me how to read the Bible. Somebody taught me how to read the Bible. Somebody taught me how to pray. Somebody taught me how to have a quiet time or devotions or whatever your word is. How to just spend some time with Jesus and just talk to him. They showed me the verse where it says that Moses talked to God like a man talks to a friend. And that that's the way that their relationship worked. And it wasn't Shakespearean, King James language. But they just talked to each other. And I tried to do that, and I tried to walk with God every day, and, and I did all of these things, and I led a Bible study, and I tried to share my faith, tried to memorize scripture. I did all of these things and was super involved, and that's the way that my life was going. And I got to a spot where, and I was, by the way, I was experiencing all kind of wonderful things coming into my life because I was living life God's way, Yes. Like all the wisdom that was coming into my relationships and my behaviors and everything. It's just everything was getting better. And the smile was still on my face. But there was a guy who was uh, mentoring me at the time. And he came and approached me and said, Josh, you're like one of the best professional Christians I've ever seen. And you got it all down. 
He's like, but, he says, he's like, it's like I can watch you spinning. It's like I can watch you spinning in order to achieve something with God still. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm, like, I know my salvation was paid for and Jesus did it all and all this kind of stuff. It's like, yeah, you believe Jesus did it all for you to get to heaven someday, but you don't believe he did it all so you can live your life every day under the pleasure of God and wake up every morning and say, God, even if I blow it every single moment of today, Jesus is going to pay for that too. And not that I'm passive or not that I don't care, but I get to live in the reckless confidence of a child Amen. and just know I'm loved. And he said, he said, you don't have that. He said, so here's what I'd like you to do. He said, I'd like you to stop for a season of time doing all the stuff. I want you to stop reading the Bible, stop praying, stop doing your devotions. And I said, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> I, did, I thought he was the devil himself. And he's like, take a month, Josh. He's like, your theology says you don't have to do any of this stuff because Jesus has got you. So don't. Now, I'm not saying you should do this, by the way. But I told him no, and I walked away, and I thought he was wrong. I couldn't see it. And I walked away, and, and, and as I went along, and, and I thought, and I prayed, God started to come in and say, I know this doesn't make sense to you, but by faith, I just want you to do this. This is like a new leap for you to take. So take this leap, and don't do the things. And you're just going to hang back and watch what happens. Watch the miracle unfold. Are you weirded out yet? I was weirded out. And so I did, and I never cracked open my Bible. I went for a whole month. I'm looking at it across the room, and it's guilting me from across the room. And I'm not praying, and I'm wondering, what's everybody going to think of me? I don't have any nice little Christian thing to, like, work into my next conversation to prove that I had my quiet time today. And what's God think of me? And it started to kind of haunt me a little bit. Is he even happy today? Does he like me today? You know, people have told you, like, I love you, but I don't like you. Did I, isn't that the most horrible thing in the world? Um, it's like, have I reached that status with God? <laughs> and so it, 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 it worked on me. Anyway, so I, I'm going along, and I just give it all of this time, and I didn't go to hell, thank God. And... Um, I still kept hearing his voice. He kept speaking to me still. Um, I kept doing other parts of the Christian life, and they all still kind of worked, even though I wasn't paying my dues. And I remember this one day came, and I, I was out, and I was just walking. And I used to, like, walk to the store, and I used to walk to the park and just take walks because I wasn't married and we didn't have kids, and I used to have time way back then as opposed to now. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and I had time, and I used to take walks and just, just enjoy. And as I was taking a walk, one day I noticed, and I had noticed it before, but one day I noticed I was just talking to God on the walk, and I wasn't even thinking about it. And I had no prayer list with me that I was accomplishing I wasn't following a method. I wasn't even tracking how much time I had spent talking with God to see whether or not it counted. I was just talking to him. I was just unloading my day. And there was just something about it. And I would stop every once in a while and say, is this okay? Am I, am I allowed to do this? And it was like, no, 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 this part's okay. This part's fine. And it was just natural. It was just happening like that. And, and I remember going back to my apartment and I was... I was staying in an apartment with some guys at that time, Christian guys, and, and they said, hey, Josh, we're doing this impromptu prayer meeting. We're right here in the living room, and they're like, would you join us? And I looked at I'm, I'm like, hey, this isn't, this isn't super official. I guess I could join in with these guys and just see what happens. And I, I sit down, and we're praying about different things, and it, it kind of comes around to my turn. I don't even remember what we were praying about, but I start to pray, <clears throat> and nothing feels weird about it. I just pray, and I get to the end of the prayer, and I say amen, and the room goes quiet. And I open up my eyes, and they're all sitting there, and they're just kind of looking at me with their eyes open. 
And I'm like, what? What's, going, what's wrong? And they say, we've not heard you pray that way before. They're like, you're just, you're just talking to God. You're not praying. You're just talking to God. It should be. Um, and I'm not saying that I got a halo that day. <laughs> not saying that. Not trying to make myself some kind of hero or, or center of a story. Just trying to say, like, what was my prayer life even like before that? And God, God saw something inside me that needed to change. And when I look back on it, I would say that I had an infection in my soul, a perfection infection. Like that rhymed. I know. I know. I'm so sorry. A perfection infection. And I use the word infection because... What's an infection? Well, it's like, you, you know what it is. I mean, you get wounded and, and the thing ought to heal by itself because your body's a miracle and your, your body just heals itself. But then something gets in the way like an infection and you can't heal and you can't grow and you can't move forward until the infection gets addressed. Yes, that's how it works. And our souls are the same thing. Sometimes we get an infection in our soul and you can't heal, you can't grow, you can't move on. And God saw perfectionism in me and said, I have to go after it. And this is the only surgery that I can do. And so he did surgery on me and I had to stop doing devotions for a month and I didn't go to hell. Amen. A friend of mine, Steve Krug, uh, he's actually one of those college roommates, as a matter of fact, but he told me this story. And when he was younger, he was in his house and he was like in the living room or something. I forget what, what the situation was. But he passed some gas. I know it's church. Are we going to be okay? Can we do this? And so he was in his room. He was in this other room. And, and he does one of those things. And, and first service, we just kind of pretended like we didn't know what gas was. So that's okay. You guys go ahead. Um, <clears throat> So anyway, so he passes gas in this other room, and he's alone with his flatulence and smell over there. And, and then he does this thing where he walks into the kitchen, and his mom, Marlene, is there. Now, I've met Marlene, and Marlene is a very straight shooter. She's very bubbly and sassy kind of personality. And so Steve walks into the kitchen where Marlene is, and she shouts at him, cling on. And he says, what Star Trek got to do with it? And she says, not Star Trek. You've got a smell cling on. And he thought he was legal because he was in the other room. <sighs> Some of you got saved a long time ago. And you have a sense of law and self-reliance that has clung to you. This is my first flatulence ever in a sermon in my whole career to talk about that. How did it go? Did it go okay? We all right? All right, it is clung to you. And the more it clings, the more it stinks up your relationship with God, right? <sighs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The first part of the message was just so serious. And I'm, I'm like staring at it. I'm like, I need something to lift it up. It's Christmas after all. Oh, gosh. <laughs> it could go on and on, yes? Um, okay. All right. All right. All right. Woo! All right. <laughs> Here's the thing. So I'm going to try and be serious. If you get saved by grace and you believe Jesus paid for all of your sins in the past, and then you start the Christian life and you're like, okay, now I got to get to work. If that's what you conclude, it will steal all the joy out of your relationship with God. And some of you are here today, and you're like, I used to have joy. I used to have love. It used to feel like I was in love with Jesus. But it doesn't feel that way anymore. And maybe the number one reason for that, maybe, is that somewhere along the, on, along the way, you started to think you had to earn each day with him. And relationships don't work that way. And you already know that. It, it, it's not just God. Even, even in your marriage, Right? If your marriage becomes a task that you have to do every day in order to keep that person from leaving you, what kind of relationship is that? That's an unhealthy relationship. So why do we take unhealthy things like that and, and attribute them to God? He's not that way with us. 
No, Jesus died for you so that you don't have to live in that yo-yo kind of experience in your walk with him. Like there might be things tomorrow or today that he wants for you and he wants you to walk in those things so that you have greater joy and a greater experience of freedom in your Christian walk. But if you don't do any of it, by the end of the day, he will not love you any less. No less. Loves you just as much because his love for you was based on what Jesus did, not on what you did at all, at all. We've got to figure that out. Paul went to uh, a city called Galatia in the New Testament. And I'm going to read part of that to you. So he goes to this city called Galatia and he preaches the gospel there. And he preaches this gospel, okay? He preaches the gospel that Jesus did it all for you. It was not a cheap grace. It was a costly grace. Your righteousness was, his righteousness was given to you. That's how you live. He gave them that kind of gospel. Lots of people got saved. And they started the very first Christian church in Galatia. And then Paul moved on. He had to move on to the next town to plant the next church. And so after all this wonderful work had been started in the right way, some other people came in. This is what Christian history tells us. Some other people came to Galatia and they started telling those brand new Christians, they said, you know what? When Jesus died for you, yeah, it was 100% grace, but now you got to get to work. And they said, first thing that you got to do is you got to get yourself circumcised, which if you know anything about circumcision, that was a high price to pay. And they say, you got to get circumcised. And it was wrong, by the way. But it's not just that that was wrong. It's that what they said, as soon as they started the conversation about this is the next thing you've got to do in order to make God happy with you again, it would have never stopped. Right? Because as soon as a Christian comes up to you and says, you know what? It's great that you got Jesus, but you have to go to this church if you want the full truth. You've just started going down a road. And as soon as somebody says, you got to listen to this worship band, or you've got to buy this book in order to have the super fulfilled life, no, 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 no. If it's one brick on the wall of, of a good life, sure, that's great. But don't tell me this is the one thing that I need in order to have the full Jesus in my life. No. Jesus is the full Jesus. Stop. Full stop. So anyway, so Paul writes to them with a little bit of passion. Galatians 3, verse 1, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Do you sense his passion? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified, which means Paul preached to them the gospel. Verse 2, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? That means by your efforts, the things that you do, or by believing what you heard, the message of the gospel received by faith. Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Do you see what he did in the last sentence there? And if you got a physical Bible in front of you, maybe underline beginning and underline finish because that's what you're supposed to see. Don't begin with grace and then think the rest is up to you. Verse 4, have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? And some of you are like, but faith feels so passive. But faith doesn't feel like I'm doing much. I know. And sometimes that's the point because not only have you lost the love and not only have you lost the joy, but in all of your efforts and trying so hard, you became the center of your relationship with God. You became the Lord because it became all about you. Too much for you? Are you with me? When it's all about my efforts, I'm the main character in the story. You're not the main character in your story. He is. And he's Lord and he's king and he's the hero of your story no matter what. And by believing in grace and letting him be the person that does it every single day, you keep Jesus the hero. It's part of what we're supposed to do. And notice he says there, can we have that verse back up again? 
It says, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by works of the law or by, by your believing what you heard? What he's saying there is, does God give you spirit? Does he work miracles among you? He's talking about the daily there. And notice all the daily stuff that comes into your life, he calls miracles. Now, you th- you're thinking, well, okay, he gave sight to the blind. Yes, but the miracles Paul's talking about aren't just those kinds of miracles. He's talking about the miracle of your marriage being brought to- back together. He's talking about the miracle of your relationship restored with your kids, about your addiction. He's talking about, he's talking about your, your credit card debt. He's talking about all those miracles that God wants to address in you. They aren't just the sum total of your effort and will and self-discipline. They're a miracle that God is going to do in your life or not at all. And we're going to explore that a little bit. Galatians 2, 20 through 21. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. It's like I'm not even involved, he says. But Christ lives in me every single day. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law or through my efforts, Christ died for nothing. I do not set aside the grace of God. People of God, brothers and sisters, we are a stubborn people. And many of us have set aside the grace of God when we got saved. And we used to have a passionate story of our salvation, and we've lost our smile. Do not set aside the grace of God. Um, During COVID, our Uh, church elders asked me to start seeing a pastoral counselor. And so I see a pastoral counselor on on, on a regular basis. It's a huge part of what keeps me walking a healthy path for myself. And um, I'm so thankful for that. And my counselor introduced to me this idea. You're going to laugh at this. Very funny. He calls it the super me. Say super me. Super me. So here's the idea. Everyone does things at different RPMs, right? Like there's certain tasks, you know, some of you guys like wash the dishes at very low RPMs and there's a very low quality at the end. Right? Certain things are medium RPMs. Certain things are super high RPMs. And they're so high. You go to max RPMs sometimes and some of you put down the Clark Kent glasses and mmm, here we go. Yes. You see what I'm saying with the super me? He's saying, here's, he says, here's the thing. Most people shift in and out of those different gears, but a perfectionist thinks they have to stay in the super me gear at all times. Ooh. And then a Christian adds a special twist. A Christian perfectionist comes along and says, I'm not sure God will even like me unless I'm at max RPMs in everything I do. I think this is what God wants from me. And I'm shocked to hear that, right, from this guy, because I'm like, I thought God dealt, dealt with that in me years ago when he had me quit my devotions and all that kind of stuff, which I started doing again, by the way. Um, <laughs> But here's the point. I still need God working on this issue in my heart still. He's been coming after me forcefully about this infection that's in my soul. And he's not done working on me yet. And maybe he's still working on you too. Because it's an infection. I'll also say this. Jesus didn't die for the super you. He died for you. Jesus did not decide from the beginning of time to love the super version of you. He chose to love you. Full stop. That matters. We have to believe that. So back to the guy who asked me, how do I believe all this? Because are, are you caught up with him now? Because it's all of us. I think that's what God's been trying to tell me all week. Is it wasn't this guy, it was all of us. 
So I would say my answer would be Romans 8 verse 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. So every single day of your life, you need to be told that there is no condemnation for me no matter what I do today. No condemnation, no accusation. You, you will not be found guilty because God sees the righteous resume of Jesus Christ all over you. And that is the way that we live. And that kind of way just drives worship and gratitude out of our hearts. And our soul starts to soften and it starts to change and we start to fall in love with Jesus all over again. That's the way that it's supposed to work. He does not want you to clean up your past or perform in your present. The other thing I would say to this man is that the best way to fight the performance infection inside of yourself is to walk in grace every day. Pick it back up. And I'll give you three ways to walk in grace. Way number one, live in a reckless God confidence every single day. Live like a toddler lives, trusting mom and dad, right? They got me. You ever see the confidence in a toddler's eyes? They've got me. That is what your Christian life should be like. Amen. Not only about my past, but about my present and my future. Next, pray for your next miracle. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. There's a spot, and I'm not going to read it to you because I don't have time, but there's a spot where the Apostle Paul looks at some things in his life, and he says, I worked really hard for these things. And then he stops himself at the end of sentence and says, wait a second, it wasn't me. It was only the grace of God that worked in me. And that's 1 Corinthians 15, 10. And you need that verse because you need the reminder that nothing in your Christian life is anything that you've done. And anything that you've done up to this point was not you. And you need to believe that because if you believe that you're the one who got you this far, you'll think it's you that gets you the rest of the way. No, pray for your next miracle. I've told this story before here at this church, how my wife and I went through a difficult season. We called the season the pit where we went through difficult times in our marriage and we fell out of love with each other. Some of you have heard me tell this before. I'm going to bring it back for just a moment. Because we loved each other, agape, we were committed to each other. We never would have said the word divorce, but we didn't like each other anymore. And we were just in that space. And some of you guys going into the Christmas season in your own marriage, you're in that space right now. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And I didn't know how to get out of that space. I didn't know how to magically create romantic love. And this elder in my church, Steve Heyer, came to me and said, Josh, you need to pray that God resurrects romantic love in you. Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you give me a list of steps to take and all these things to do? Why would you do that, Steve? Because you can't create romantic love in you. It's a miracle. Say miracle. Say miracle. Miracle. It's a miracle in you. You're not qualified to do miracles. You're not able. So you need a God miracle here in the center of your marriage. The only way you get a miracle is you pray for it. Amen? That's, that's the only way you get it. So he said, start praying. Okay. I'll start praying. And God brought romantic love back into the marriage. And we're more in love after that situation than we'd ever been before. Because God can do that. He specializes in resurrection. Did you know this? But we got to pray for it. And so some of you are like, I'm going to go into Christmas and I'm going to sit down with that person who I'm going to give the silent treatment to. And I'm not going to look them in the eyes because I haven't looked them in the eyes for the last 10 years. Because they did this thing to me and they know it and I know it and they've never made it right. You see what you're doing? 
Even though you've been forgiven all things and Jesus paid for all that you've done, you're holding this person responsible for their debt to you. Do you see it? We do it all the time. But here's the thing. I'm not just going to yell at you in a sermon and say, stop. Why? Because you can't stop. You're going to go and give them the silent treatment anyway. And the reason is, is because only a miracle can save you. Only a miracle can stop it. You're not going to forgive the person that you've been struggling to forgive all of these years unless Jesus Christ himself comes and does something inside of your soul. So you want to forgive that person this Christmas? <laughs> some, of you, some of you need to beg Jesus. God, help me. My marriage is in the state. God, help me. God, I can't forgive. God, help me. God, I'm going into the holidays. My, my anxiety, my depression is going to take over and I'm going to reach for the bottle again. God, help me. Because you can't stop it. You're not able to. Only a miracle will change it. Step three, you got to walk through the doors that God opens for you. After you've prayed, and then the Lord says, okay, I heard you. Here's an open door for you to walk through. Walk. Yes? I'm not asking you to achieve. I'm not asking you to perform. I'm not asking you to be perfect. I'm just saying sometimes God is going to come and say, here's your baby step. Take it. This Christmas, take it. You're like, every single Christmas up to this point, it's not ever been any different. Maybe it will be this year. This is how you walk in grace as a Christian. This describes every single good thing that has happened in my life since I accepted Jesus Christ to right now. I've walked in God's reckless confidence. I've prayed for the next miracle and I've taken the steps that he's put in front of me and I've missed uncounted steps that he put in front of me. And he never gives up on me. Is this resonating? Why don't you guys stand up? So what do you need this Christmas? <laughs> I grew up in the church and grew up singing hymns. Anybody grew up singing hymns? And I'm going through this message and I'm preparing for this and I'm like, you know, <laughs> you know amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me all about salvation. And then you get to the next verse. It was grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace, my fears relieved. Do you hear the conviction about what you've done? And then grace, my fears relieved because Jesus had paid it all and I, I found the grace. It was grace that brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. Not only did grace get you here, but grace is what you need every single day. It was written hundreds of years ago. Yes? The saints are calling down to us through the centuries and saying, it's grace, guys. Don't miss it. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die. I'm on a different hymn right now. Do you know which one? How great thou art. And when I think that God, his son, not sparing, God didn't spare his son, sent him to die. I scarce can't take it in. He's talking about that, that shock that you get when you know first that Jesus died for you. I can't take it in. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. Do you know what the next verse is? He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest person clean. His blood availed for me. He breaks the power of canceled sin. How does he break the power of canceled sin if it's already canceled? Jesus canceled it on the cross. And most of us picked it right back up. And we give it power in our life every day to beat us up and make us feel guilty and to hold us back. It's like, no, he, he wants to break the power of that canceled sin in you. Do you hear the saints down through the ages singing to you 
The reason they're hymns, guys, is not just because they were popular when they came out, but because their, their truth is so strong to the church that we just keep singing them and we won't stop. They wanted us to know about grace. Let's pray. Lord God, we love you, Lord. And God, we thank you for the testimony of the church. We thank you for what Paul said to the Galatians. And Lord, right now we come and we ask that you would forgive us for trying to be perfect. There's only one who was ever perfect. Forgive us for putting our confidence in ourselves. Our confidence should only ever be in you. And so right now, Lord, we ask for a miracle. Resurrect our faith. Resurrect our love for Jesus. Resurrect our joy and our smile, Lord God. And Lord, as we go into Christmas, I pray that, Lord, that you would bring miracles all across the families represented here, Lord, online and in this room. We know what miracles we're asking for today. Jesus, be powerful among us. We love you in Christ's name. Amen.